chat amongst you and, uh, and remember them. Um, if you look at the posters that we've put up uh, around the place, we've kind of tried to theme them thematically, not as easy as it was for my mother. She had very distinctive uh, interests that we could do, but you'll see the word wonderful occurs in every one of them. Mm -hmm. And that comes from uh, my aunt Madeleine. Uh, she would come to visit, and whenever my mother was giving my old man a hard time, she would take his side. He was a wonderful organizer, he did a lot of things, and then she would sing Mr. Wonderful to him, see? And uh, she did so often that the name Mr. Wonderful stuck. And so that's, uh, to pay homage to that, it's a wonderful husband, wonderful family man, sportsman, young man. So in case you're wondering, the wonderful it comes from that uh, song. And then some people asked, where did he get the name Bugs from? So he has the same, well I have the same first name as him, Dudley. But it was never used. I think his older brother said Dudley or Dugsley or couldn't quite Bugley and that became Bugs. And I think his mother was so irritated that uh, a nice name that she'd chosen had gone astray that I think she probably forced him to name me Dudley. Um, and the only time it caused confusion is when we went to visit in England and she shouted Dudley and both of us would come running. And she said, no, Dudley Senior. You know? uh, but he was known as Bugs his, his whole life to everyone. <laughs> Um, when we got the messages of condolence uh, on his passing, it was, there was a common theme that came through all the messages, and it was that he was a kind and a gentle man. Um, he set a lot of store by manners, uh, sporting etiquette, and he was always very attentive to the most humble person, to the most important person, and he spoke to them in exactly the same way. And I think that was the key to his success as an admin manager or a personal manager that he, he had as uh, part of his career. Uh, he believed in honesty, playing by the rules, giving everyone a fair chance. And I never ever remember him losing his cool or going completely ballistic. He'll get irritated and he'll be quite stern, but he, he, never, he never lost it. Um, golf was his top sport. Uh, he, probably played it the longest of any sport in his life. And although he had a quiet persona, it had a very really deeply competitive spirit. And those that might have played on the golf course might have got a, a glimpse of it. Um, he's a person that knew what he liked and he stuck to those choices. So I don't think he ever understood the hype around fine wines and fine dining. Um, I would get regaled with the fantastic meal that he had at the golf course not only how much it cost and how much there was, but how well it tasted. And that would you go on almost as long as every shot that he played on the golf course as well. Um, it gave him tremendous pleasure. Certainly his early years shaped him. He grew up in the war. He was born in the Depression in England. Uh, they moved from house to house. Uh, places were bombed. Uh, his mother got divorced quite early on. And... Um, Again, that would come through. You're not finishing your food. Oh, we would have loved to have had that when I was growing up, and the rations and all that sort of thing. Um, and, and again, in my early childhood, we'd be building uh, model airplanes, Spitfires and Hurricanes and Mr. Schmitz, all of which you could sort of draw from memory. Um, and so he was uh, had made an obvious impression on him. Uh, then they came out to South Africa with his uh, stepfather and my mother. They lived in Fishhook in Musenberg. Uh, they started playing rugby from Musenberg High School. I think there's a photograph of an unbeaten team that they had there in 1949. Uh, he spent a lot of time on the beach at Fishhook. Um, worked at Standard Bank in town. And then the opportunity came to go to Northern Rhodesia. I think that's where everything exciting was happening, so off he went. Um, uh, going through his things, I see there was a letter from the Livingston Club where he was wrapped over the knuckles or having guests without writing them into the book. Um, and it was a different world in those days. You'll see when he was in New Zealand, he used to fly, he worked for Shell, he used to fly around. You can see getting off the plane, he's got a hat with his briefcase as well. So quite a formal world in those days. Um, he moved up to the Copper Belt where he met my mother. Um, she was a, a nursing sister and he was on the mines. And when they saw the penance coming, they up and off to New Zealand. And who can do that? They, he didn't have a job. He just packed us all up and off we went to New Zealand. By the very next day, on arrival in New Zealand, he had a job. But you couldn't just pack your things up and go halfway around the world. Um, but I think New Zealand wasn't quite 
what you expect if you've grown up in Central Africa. Uh, first of all, you had to take your own rubbish to the tip. But you had to build another school. It was quite a socialistic uh, country in those days. And so well, Craig was born there, so he's a, a Kiwi. Hello, mate. Uh, and it wasn't long before we, we came back to Zambia. Uh, and, and that's where I think most of my early memories and Craig memories come from. Uh, fantastic golf course that we had in Zambia. Only a nine-hole golf course, but uh, a dambo in the middle full of hippos and crocs. Uh, we ran wild there as well. You'd never give uh, children the freedom that we had in those days. Um, but it all came to an end when we all went to boarding school. So from 10 years old, you go to catch the plane to South Africa and you come home three times a year. So that was a bit grim, but you did look forward to your holidays. Um, then eventually we moved to Cape Town and I was pretty unimpressed with Cape Town. Uh, small garden, no horses, no dogs. Uh, the wind blew the whole time, sandy, but eventually you get to understand it because both my mother having studied nursing at Kritiske and my father uh, having spent such happy times at Fisher and Musselburgh, you got a sense that they felt that they'd come home and uh, they really did enjoy Cape Town and slowly the lifestyle sort of creeps into you. Um, he started cycling, uh, he had a custom made bike pull trip but then I'm not quite sure how he got roped into it but he became one of Tim Noakes' guinea pigs and there's a whole poster on it there. And I think they were looking for people that had formerly been sportsmen but had some, gone to seed somewhat. And they were going to get them back into shape. And uh, it was quite a strenuous exercise. He had to have muscle bars he's taken. Um, I remember they were also looking at the psychological uh, aspect of, uh, of running. And I think it was Helga Schirmer, I think was the psychiatrist. And he made my father run with a tape recorder. And he was supposed to record his thoughts while he was running. And he says, well, what must I say? He says, no anything that comes into your mind, see? And it just so happened that there was uh, a young lady, I think part of the research team, that was cycling in front of them. So he was commentating on what he could see <laughs> in front of her. And he only realized later that it was the psychologist, sports psychologist's wife. <laughs> um, uh, he, he joined Felico Klein and Edwards here in Cape Town. Um, my mother was at Victoria Hospital. Uh, VKE was probably the best consulting engineering firm in South Africa at the time. Responsible for the Toy Swift Tunnel. I think that was one of their uh, most famous uh, jobs. And I actually did more black jobs, engineering black jobs, than I did wine making uh, jobs. So if you want to know anything about um, the ventilation system, the tunnel, or uh, Catalonic or anionic bitumen slurries. I went to the soil testing lab. You can come and see me afterwards. Um, but I think uh, golf is what brought them back together again, my mother and my father. And here at Westlake Golf Course, they spent many, many pleasurable times on the golf course. And the, the social aspect was also very, very important to them as well. Um, we had tremendous neighbors. Brian and Jeanine Lucas are here today. Um, <coughs> Janine was always a sort of a competitor for my mother, got her windsurfing, uh, got her cycling, helped her the running. Um, Brian has always been very helpful in terms of uh, helping my father with certain things like pumps and boreholes and that sort of thing as well. Um, but some of the earliest memories that I have of my father, because you know, it, it, we all kind of know him and we don't really want to have a chronological history, but there's certain things that stick into my mind or my senses, and uh, a lot of them have to do with smell. And so one of them was like Old Spice in those days. Mm -hmm. Any gentleman could yes. throw Old Spice on. And brew cream, you couldn't go out without brew cream on. Mm -hmm. um, and then I remember he always used to love his bacon and eggs in the morning, and he used to use a white pepper on them, and white pepper is a very distinctive smell. So uh, a mouthful of bacon, runny egg yolk, and white pepper takes me right back to my earliest memories of my father at breakfast. Um, he was quite a crooner as well. He liked sort of uh, uh, Frank Sinatra and those characters. And you could always tell when he was happiest packing the dishwasher or working in the kitchen, you would hear him crooning away. Very, really good voice. Um, and then other sort of memories as well, going back to boarding school on a Sunday afternoon. Uh, you'd listen to the radio, listen to men from the ministry or the Navy lock, things like that. Or, on a Saturday morning, where you, there wasn't a mall we'd go shopping, you'd go to the, the drop-in in Plumstead, and you would go to the 
pushed off and then you would go somewhere else. And then we'd listen to Pip, the Pip Freeman show on a Saturday morning as well. Um, so those are all the very fond memories that I have. Um, as I said, he, he knew what he wanted. Christmas was always turkey and ham and veg. And even his very last Christmas, he insisted on it and he got his own way. Um, so those are some of my memories. I'm sure Craig's got some of his own. And once again, thank you very much for coming to say goodbye to folks. Thanks. Good afternoon, my dear people. Uh, I'd like to thank you all for coming here to see off our dad today. Um, the message we've, we've had, geez, I didn't know where the pole is. <laughs> anyway, the messages that, we have, have, that have, we've had have been many and they have warmed my soul. It's been really special with the Facebook messages, the WhatsApp messages, phone calls, everything. And looking around and seeing so many people here tonight not only speaks a great deal of what respected man he was, but also that the Bible is going to be enormous. <laughs> I'm sure he, he's reminding me to close it off and then going up money to pay for the bill. <laughs> anyway, but at 87, one doesn't have too many friends left alive. But he kept in touch and stayed active through sport, mainly golf, as Daddy said. That kept, kept him fit and social. I must say though, I do apologize on his behalf. In his last year after my mom died, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I thought it was gonna work, I practiced this, man. Okay, he went into serious mourning and couldn't kick himself out of it. His health deteriorated, yeah. the more it did, the less he wanted to chat to everybody. So he wasn't ignoring any of you. He just didn't want people to see his decline. Mm. Nor you hear his problems. Oh, <laughs> I should love the people crying. He said that for us, his problems for us and for Carla. Carla, I must thank you. Without you, you would have been, he would have been in complete dark misery. She's a doctor, you know. You gave him back his dignity and made his life really comfortable right to the end. A doctor on call. Wow. Carla, we thank you. We can't thank you enough. What a start. Dad loved you. When Dad went to hospital for the last time, he really missed Carla. Or well, visiting and boy did he moan. They won't let me get out of bed. They won't let me walk. The food is crap. The coffee's cold. The toast, look at this softest wrapper. The invisible door. Dad, what's the invisible door? Well, when eventually I do ring this bell and someone comes, they go out and they never come back again. <laughs> anyway, at the hospital he lay there hoping someone would attend to him and he was only seen once a day. He at home, he had service on tap, breaky in the morning, wheat fix, toast, bubble at 10 o'clock, then a bit of a walk, sit on the chair, watch his TV, home cooked meals from Bronwyn and Carla and ourselves. All those things were non-existent in the hospital, so he was very chuffed to be home. In the mornings, my day started at 5.30 with WhatsApps from him, not asking me about his health and how he slept, and sent Carla to come see me. Couldn't say that at the hospital, get a doctor to see him at 5.30. <laughs> Carla was on 24-hour duty. He also had TV at home, and uh, he loved watching the cricket, and uh, maybe uh, he, he left a bit quicker than he should have due to the state of our cricket. <laughs> but uh, lucky he didn't hear the last result. He used to tell me, Fife shouldn't go and toss in the middle of the field. You should just go and tell the, the captain, what do you want to do? Do you want to bat or do you want to field? <laughs> anyway, we had also massive backing from the creative wellness at our house at where they sent people to look after him uh, on, on a daily basis. And he grew very fond of the ladies. And I'm very grateful the way they handled that. Edith, Patricia, and Amandi, drop my hat to you. Anyway, we people who aren't here are Gordon's kids. Well, they're adults now. Gordon was my dad's brother. They've been great solace during this time. And I want to say, Melanie, Brendan, Thomas, Mike and Stella, we can feel you in spirit. So too, my mother's sister, Matin, 
She's been a pillar of strength in this family and has deeply moved and now she is the oldest matriarch and Madeline stays from. Perry and Sandrina, the Germans, some of you will know him, he plays here quite often. He's been, a, he's been also a great upliftment in Bugsy's life, especially for through these dark last eight months. Perry was dad's number three son. Two, one. <laughs> I'd also like to thank Westlake for their wonderful hospitality and seeing our needs to our needs. Thank you, Lindsay and the barman, for the boys there. Thank you so much. And again, Coca-Cola Peninsula Beverages for your drinks. Thanks, Dan, Dolphy, Matthew, and Herman. Thank you. It's a privilege working for you guys too. And thank you for your kindness you have shown me from when my mother died up to now. Brilliant. And then Dudley and Bronwyn, they did all the photographs and, 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 the, and, the, and the, the brochure when you came in. And that was a great effort and it took them a lot of time. And then to all Dad's friends, the golfers, his co-workers, and everyone for being his friend. He cherished you all. He really loved you all. He talks, spoke about you all the time, and I know that. Anyway, just a few memories. I remember my dad from my early days. I met him in 1964. <laughs> we've had a 56 year relationship he was my dad my father a great parent i was privileged he sent me to a wonderful school i was privileged he cared i was privileged he loved my mother till the end i was privileged he was married forever i was privileged they were good people should have given these two two books <laughs> <laughs> I was privileged he was old school. I was privileged he loved Dudley and me. We were very lucky people indeed. He watched all my cricket and rugby games and shared my ups and downs, especially the downs. He only encouraged, he was ne never negative. He did think I was better than anyone else, <coughs> which he did mention and I tried quickly to change the subject, but only when he said Cummins is, 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 should be playing in front of me, then, then I would listen to him talk. <laughs> And Stuart, no, Kevil, no, no, one, no one's better than Kevil. The only man he had was in recent years was for me to lose weight. But he didn't happen that too long. I said, you won't have to worry in a year's time. We went to theatres, as Dudley said, we went to operas and concerts. Dudley played in many of them and it was fantastic to go there. The city hall was impressive with a full choir and orchestra performing to a full house. Those are great memories. memories. He was a kind gentleman gentleman. He never raised his hand to me. Never hit me once. He left that to the house masters at school. And boy, did they take advantage of that. <laughs> when he retired, he joined this wonderful club and played out his many days on this course with his and our beloved mom, Eleanor. He lived for his golf. And even while he was coming to the end, he kept wanting to play nine holes. I regret not dragging him the one Friday to come to the course, even though it was for two holes. Anyway, when mum died, he needed a golf partner and volunteered that job to me. Boy, did that have, did he have to put out a lot of fires when I joined this club. <laughs> the first game, there was a complaint. Drove too far. There was a complaint. Some of the members are here. You guys were moaning about me. Yeah. Uh, drove too far. Members, were, members weren't happy with my drives. I learned quickly, though, but my dad kept the peace. He was good at but not making a big issue out of these things, and things solved themselves through him. However, it was a great privilege, as I said, to have played with him. I average about one game of golf in ten, uh, per year for the 10 years, maybe two, one, nothing a year. This year, I played 43 games of golf with my dad. And they were the most special times of my life. I'll cherish that forever. But sometimes things got heated when we're out in that caddy cart. <laughs> Only because of the driving of the caddy cart. Most of this is due to his bad hearing. But once we got around there, it was all good. So I had a learning curve and patience, and he did too. I'm sad we didn't win any matches together. I know he won a lot of matches with my mother, but we won nothing. <laughs> Could even come fourth or fifth. Anyway, one of the first days I came here and get on the caddy cart, I don't know anyone, and we're sitting on the caddy cart. There are two punches in the front seat. What are these for? Now there's for when you get to the green and you punch. And I said, I'm going to break them, put them in the back. Where is the place for me to sit? 
I said, I don't need them anyway. I only play two shots and then I have to pick up or don't get to the greens. Anyway, and, and then uh, he drives me. He says he wants to drive and we're driving on the course. And he's had that tour with his friends and I'm seeing them like a little spaz kid. And there, 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 I'm driving in the car. Greg and then dead. He would never let me drive. I mean, anyway, and then when he hits his ball, I hit mine. And he'll say, should we go to my ball first? And then we go to the, where's my ball, where's my ball? There it is, 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 there it is. Oh, God, why did you tell me where the ball was? And then when I did tell him, he'll say, I've seen it. So then I said, ah, can't you tell me if you've seen the ball, just put your hand up. And I go, there, there, there. Don't talk to me, I'm not a dog. And then he plays a shot, divots, fill the divot. He's every shot, divot. Then I hit one, scuff it. Don't put too much sand in that. We're going to run out of sand. <laughs> and then, putting on the course. That's a long one. One day, my boy, you're going to be a good putter like me. In fact, when I was your age, I was deadly around the greens and I could chip out of bunkers. And go. <laughs> Same sort of thing. I once borrowed his dress suit. Dad, can I borrow your dress suit, please? And I was playing rugby in those days. So I, didn't, I wasn't too bulky as I was now. Am now. And uh, he said, yeah, it'll fit you, but it might be a bit too broad for you in the shoulders. I mean, <laughs> I was that front row, man. <laughs> anyway. <clears throat> so anyway, um, the last thing is going to be a bit, Dad, I want you to know how much I love you. You were special, more than special life itself. You don't know how sad I am to have you gone. You gave me freedom and you made me proud. You sacrificed many things for us. I really, really appreciated what you did. Dad, keep your head down on the golf course in the sky. Say hi to mum. See you one day. I love you. Thanks for listening, guys. <laughs> the big song. Or well, does deploy? Does anyone want to say anything? Okay, thanks, guys. You can go and have a drink and snacks or serve shortly. <laughs>